Hey guys, it's O2 and Shane GVG Guys for Scout, and you guys would not even believe it. I am so I'm a big component of picture books, and one of my favorite childhood authors is Jan Brett. And so we are in Pensacola right now, and we hit the books a million this morning, and had no idea that she is here, and she is gonna sign our books. So we are number. 47. I got this cute bag. I'll show it to you maybe up close later, but it's for her new book called The Mermaid. So that's very exciting. I'm so excited to show you. We're going to go get our book signed. So exciting. Presentation, and then we will use the line numbers to sign up, you know, to form the line for the autographing. At this time, let's give Jan Brett a good Pensacola welcome. instruments is a double bass and that's what my husband plays in the Boston Symphony Orchestra. He's been playing in the orchestra for 56 years. So he goes with me on my book tour and here he is. Thank you Joe. We um, have just come from back from Japan which incidentally is where this book is set. It takes place in Japan with his tour, and the Boston Symphony went all over Japan playing their concerts. So we have two different art forms that we both like to do. When I go out to my mailbox or look at my email, the question children ask me the most is how do I get ideas for my books? So I'd like to tell you how I got the idea for the mermaid, and then I brought the animal Santa because we're nearing the winter time season. And I think I'll say a few words about that because this is a retelling. It's the Goldilocks story set underwater. And this is a story that I made up. So you can do both of those techniques when you do your writing. But I've always loved the Goldilocks story. Ever since I was in kindergarten, I wanted to be a children's book illustrator, but I was also very curious. And I remember those days of always doing things for the first time, going to a friend's house for the first time, riding a bike for a first time, patting a horse for the first time, and that's what happens in the Goldilocks story. You probably know about it. She's walking through the woods. She sees a mysterious, curious looking house hidden in the trees, but the door is open a little bit. She walks inside and she tries the porridge, finds the one that's just right. The chair finds the one that's just right and sees the beds and finds the one that's just right. And then in come the bears. It's that's whose house it's been. And they um, surprise her. And off she goes having had a most amazing experience, which is what I like to focus on. So in my story, Goldilocks is a mermaid and it's set underwater. She sees a beautiful seashell house and goes inside. But what kind of creatures would live there? So I had to think about that. I was visiting my daughter who is stationed in Okinawa, Japan, which is a tropical island. It's very far south. And we were snorkeling and my son-in-law was pointing, pointing, pointing to a little um, shelf of coral. And you know, you can't talk underwater, it just comes out blub, blub, blub. <laughs> so he was pointing and there was a baby octopus. It was about three or four inches tall and it was kind of a little bit floating and some of its arms were on the coral and it was waving its little arms back and forth. It was kind of see-through, pinky brown color. And I thought it was the cutest thing I had ever seen. And then right to my left was a big lionfish, which you know, I know you know about lionfishes. They're very voracious predators, probably would eat that baby. 
So I kind of felt like maybe I saved it because coral, because octopuses don't have any bones. They're mollusks. They can fit into very small places. And that's one of their strategies for growing up when they're baby octopuses to get away from their prey. So I'm gonna put Goldie uh, Mermaid aside for a minute because I wanna tell you something about the animal Santa, which is a story I made up. Because I know you guys are all writing your own stories. I want you to think about your, what I'm telling you about this one, think about your story. I'm gonna make a, do a drawing and make it like an art lesson. Well, this is a story, if you ever have a, a weird idea that comes to you, remember that idea because I was working late at night, just a normal night in the summer at our cabin in the Berkshires. It was really, really hot. And for some reason, into my mind came this idea, people have Santa Claus, but how about animals? Do they have a Santa Claus? Now, why would that idea come in? I guess that's why in cartoons they always put a light bulb over someone's head when they have an idea. It comes from nowhere. And so that, if that happens to you, think about maybe making a story out of it. I decided I would set my story in Northern Canada, a little tribe of, of animals that maybe nobody knew about. And they would get pres presents on Christmas Eve, but there were, and they knew it was from the animal Santa, but there were no footprints or anything, so they didn't know where it came from. So they decided to set a trap for Santa Claus. They didn't want to catch him and stop him from doing his work. They just wanted to know who he was. So it turns out it's a snowy owl. And of course, he uses his wings to get around. No flying reindeer for the animal Santa. And that's how he would make his way and give the presents. So the main characters were Little Snow, a bunny, and his big brother. So an artist always likes to investigate the characters that they are going to draw. So I'll show you how I investigated I brought along one of my characters. This is Little Snow. <laughs> but now Little Snow, when I first got him, was was a little bit smaller than this. <laughs> so now we just call him Snowy because he's no longer little. And Little Snow is a domesticated bunny, which means his mother, father, grandmother, grandfather are all owned by people. He's not wild at all. But the reason I chose him out of his litter was because he looked like the snowshoe rabbit that I have in my book. And the interesting thing about snowshoe rabbits, and they have a, um, they have a connection with the octopus, they change color. So in the summer, the snowshoe rabbit is brown. He's a little bit. <laughs> I think this Florida weather is making him feel like he needs to shed some of this thick fur. We're pretty wintry up in New England now. Um, they start out brown in the summer because they're hiding from their predators, might be a fox or a coyote, and they hide in the brambles or the tall grass and they're all brown. And then as the winter comes along, they get some white patches on their fur. And then by the time the ground is covered with snow, they're pure white. And so they look a little bit like this bunny. And they even have a little bit of a darker tips to their uh, ears and their nose, it is, nose is a little bit gray. But then an artist always is looking to see little details that they can put on their characters to make them more authentic. And I noticed, I had always thought bunnies had round tails. Just look at his tail, it's very long. <laughs> and that's how I learned, what, what I learned from having my own bunny. So he lives in Joe's office now. He has a little, off, he has a little environment there. And he loves to look out the window and look at the other rabbits who come and come up to his window and look inside. But he has to stay inside because he's domesticated. So and he's gonna go into the bus. I'm just gonna kneel down so he doesn't have a long draw. There we go. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Bunny. <laughs> and now for going back to the mermaid. I just wanted to tell you about the two types of stories. I'm gonna make a drawing lesson for you. And normally I use my watercolors and my little brushes, but it takes an hour to do an inch. So today I brought my markers so it would be a faster drawing. And I'm going to draw up a picture of Father Octopus and tell you about some of the things I learned about octopuses, which I found to be a very fascinating animal. And a little bit about Okinawa, Japan, where I set my story. So when I say set my story, I mean where it takes place. So we have the main character, we have the setting, and we have the plot, what takes place in the story. 
and I'm going to start out with a shape, which is, and if you look on my website, if you can't remember all the steps for this drawing, you can go on my website. I have a how to draw video. So I'm gonna to have to move this out a little bit so that people can see. It's a little bit precarious, this easel. And I will have to turn it towards you. I just want everyone to have a chance to go think along with me so that you can draw it. First it comes a shape that's almost like an egg shaped and that's going to form the octopus's mantle. Most people think that the round shape, well here are his eyes, this will help you understand where I am in the drawing. There are his eyes. Um, this round shape is actually called the mantle and it's not his head, it's where the internal organs are. So it comes down here and this is where his head is and his he has more than one brain and more than one heart and then his stomach and everything is here and he has a little funnel in the back that he can move around and he can spray water out of that. It goes through his gills and that can either make him go very fast like a jet and sprays water out or he can use it to um, show a cloud of ink. He can push a cloud of ink out of there. He has a gland there. If he wants to hide from his enemies, he can make the water turn dark purplish black around him in a cloud. Or, like what I found out when I went to the New England Aquarium, he can also take that and spray salt water on people. <laughs> so I'll tell you a little bit of, about that more in a minute, because I went to the New England Aquarium to have an arms-on experience with their giant Pacific octopus, which is the same kind that I saw in Okinawa, Japan, a baby one. So they have eight arms, and they are called arms, not tentacles for the octopus. And it's called octopus because octo means eight. And I can use these arms to make a little bit of humor in my drawing, because let's see if I think I've got seven now. One, two, three, four, five, six. So I'll have one arm coming around from the back and maybe touching his mantle to show that he's like thinking about what could be coming next. And then I'll have a, the last arm will be coming from the back and it'll be a little bit shorter to show that that arm is coming from the other side of him. Now the octopus eats his mouth parts or has a beak like a parrot and that's the only hard part of an octopus. The rest is squishy and he can go through a very small area. The area is defined by how big his beak is, and it's about like a parrot's beak. There's a top and a bottom mandible, and it's black, and it's in the middle of where all those arms join. And where the arms touch each other, there's like a little bit of webbing <coughs> where the um, octopus, when they want to capture prey, can use their arms to be like a big umbrella and make a corral for whatever they want. They're pretty good eaters. Um, I know that because <laughs> The octopus I saw at New England Aquarium was about, I'd say, maybe 15 pounds and six feet, but the largest ever recorded was 300 pounds and 30 feet from arm, tip of arm to tip of arm. So they grow extraordinarily fast, but they only live to be about four years old. That's the oldest anyone's ever found an octopus to live, even in, the, in an aquarium where they're not having to deal with um, other forces, other predators. So this is the octopus is going to be look like um, a Japanese guy. And when I was drawing it, I thought he looked a little bit like an alien. Was it friendly enough to take the place of the three bears? Because I wanted a character that would look a little bit fierce, but also lovable too. So I talked to my best little friend, Alma, who's seven years old, and she suggested I put hats on the octopuses. And I thought, what a great way to make them look more friendly. So I was using my artistic license and taking her advice, and I put the kind of hat that the fishermen would wear in Okinawa, because it's, as I said, it's tropical, and the sun beats down and is very hot. And so they wear these hats that almost are like a little parasol over their heads. First, they protect their head from the sun. Now remember, that's the mantle, not the head but it's kind of taking the, it's looking like a head in this picture. But the Okinawan fishermen would, um, this hat would cover almost their whole body, so it would protect them from the, give them a little bit of shadow. 
So now it's got seaweed growing off of it because I wanted to make sure this looked like it was an underwater scene. So there's the beginning of the hat. And then also he would wear a kimono, which is um, Japanese clothes. And a kimono is for what women wear, but the men also wear a version of a kimono that's similar, but diff a little different. And on top of the kimono, which usually the Japanese women wear a beautiful silk long dress. It has an obi that ties around the waist and is often made of very beautiful colors according to what season it is or even the age of the, of the person. And they, one of the things that I love about it is the inside of the kimono is a yet a different color. So when you walk, you make that little flap of silk turn so you can see that other color underneath. Very subtle and very beautiful. And this is a happy coat. This goes on top of the kimono and I'm just wearing it like a blazer, but it's an antique one. And the reason I made the octopuses all have blue um, garb on is because it's made out of indigo cloth. And indigo is a kind of plant it's a flower, and then when you put it in boiling water, it lets off a blue dye, and then it makes this beautiful color. And this is very traditional in olden days Japan, and this scarf is also from made from indigo cloth. And then when I turn back to you, I want you to try to guess what I'm thinking. So it could be happy, sad, scared, surprised, and I want you to say it out loud. So are you ready for the first one? Yeah. Yes? Okay, here comes number one. There's gonna be two. You're right. So you didn't even see a smile. So probably when you're drawing a picture, the first thing you do is make a big smiley face and you can still do that. But also remember that those eyes are gonna reflect what your character is doing. And then that's gonna help your story in your picture move forward along the narrative is how that character is feeling. Because they're almost like little actors for you. So what really happened behind my, my hands where the corners of my mouth went up, pushed my cheeks up, and then made my eyes look a little bit crescent shaped, and maybe my eyebrows went up a notch. So here comes, that was number one, here comes the last one. See if you can guess this one. Surprise! Surprise! You all got that right away. So that time I made my mouth in a giant O, probably my chin went down a little bit, to make the O, and then that pulled my eyes down. And then also I widened my eyes because when you're surprised, you're trying to see the whole, everything around you, your field of vision expands. So that was another clue that I was surprised by something. Again, probably my eyebrows went up like I was just didn't know what was gonna happen next. And that was opening up my eyes wide. And then even more subtly, a lot of times when you draw somebody surprised, just automatically you draw long eyelashes. And that is because all of a sudden, instead of seeing from my eyelashes from the front, my eyes are wide open, so they're up against my, the top of my eyelid. And that's a little bit subtle, but that is also one of the clues that we have as very, um, of human beings that are very um, understanding of the clues that other people's faces have. So now I'm gonna color him in and give you some more art ideas, <clears throat> and I'm going to use one of these Prismacolor markers. Their um, artists use them a lot because they have a whole range of colors. And if you love to collect color names in your head, like Magenta Chartreuse, Fuchsia, Sienna Brown, um, Chalk, all those cool colors, you probably are gonna be an artist because artists love their colors and putting their colors together. So this one I think has a kind of a dumb name. I think it's called Flagstone. <laughs> but sometimes they have really neat names. But um, I, I think one of my favorites is Chartreuse or Magenta. But now the octopus, he, they start out being kind of a pinky, browny, gray color. And then whenever they're going uh, um, along the ocean floor, they can mimic their surroundings so that they can hide and they camouflage themselves. So if the octopus is sitting on pink and blue coral, they'll turn pink and blue. If they're sitting on red coral, they might have red stripes. They can make polka dots, stripes, all kinds of um, variations. 
of their colors. Now when I'm doing these arms, I'm leaving a little white space because they'll have room for the suckers. I'm gonna tell you all about that. Uh, my adventure going to the New England Aquarium. So there's the kind of pinkish color. Now I'm going to try to do what I said and pay the most attention to that character's eyes with a little darker shade of that same color. So I'm going to make a little circle around the eyes and then they don't really have eyebrows, but I'm going to make little humps in their skin above their eyes. They can actually raise parts of their skin in little bumps, like sort of big goose pimples. You know how like if you get very cold, you can get goosebumps? Well, an octopus can make great big ones so they can eat blend in. So I'm making circles around his eyes and then I'll use my artistic license and make kind of like surprise wrinkles in his forehead to make him look even more Surprise, I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking maybe he's looking at his baby octopus's cradle and seeing the mermaid there. I can't believe that he's never seen a mermaid before. So he's a little bit worried, but he's also curious. So he has that curious, worried, amazed look combo. So a lot of the things that our characters are thinking about are combinations of things. So um, you can be really subtle with that when you're imagining what your characters are thinking. So there is shading on his arms. So I'm taking the same color, but a deeper shade of it. And that makes the characters look a little bit more three-dimensional rather than just flat like a cartoon. I mean, there's nothing wrong with cartoons, but this is just the technique for this more realistic character. And I'll show you the same shading on his hat, which is made out of either palm fronds or could be some kind of thick grass that they would um, weave together to make the hat. These are what would be used in the olden days. Nowadays, I bet a lot of the fishermen have ball caps, but there is something really great about having this wide brimmed hat to protect them from the sun. So there's the light color called marigold. And then here's a little bit of a darker color that I'll go along the edge to show you more about that shading. Now this could also be done with the gray, and if you know, love to draw in pencil as much as I do, you know you can take your pencil and go on the side to do your shading. So I'm hoping that's starting to look a little bit like that this is uh, rounded from that shading on the side, and then I can add a little bit of the texture of the weaving of the, of the leaves that have now turned yellow because it's been in the sun. And then I'm making it a little bit darker where it goes underneath, underneath his mantle. And then I thought, well, I want to show that this is really an underwater scene. So I decided I would have seaweed growing on the octopus's hat because he's been underwater. And when we were little kids, we, my dad had a big boat and we'd go off in the boat for like two weeks. It was a big old sailboat, wooden sailboat. And um, around August, my dad would say, okay girls, you gotta jump overboard and here's a big brush and you have to scrub all that seaweed off the water line because it's slowing us down. So we would do that. And I thought, well, then maybe the same thing happened to Octopus's hat, that he would have some uh, green seaweed growing off the brim. So sometimes when you have an experience, you'll find that it will appear later in a story that you write or a picture that you draw. You never know when that's going to happen. And then uh, this is a technique I'm using. I want to make that seaweed look filmy and light. And I thought, well, green and the gold and this pinkish brown. Maybe I'll make a nice red rim to his hat to make it more uh, attractive. And then maybe in order to show that it's floating in the water and the currents are kind of waving it around like when you go underwater and your hair gets all floaty i'll have these little s strands from his hat that will be floating in the water too so it kind of looks like he's floating he's kind of dancing in the waves now i've got two colors of blue here's another helpful hint a lot of times if you want your picture to look more vibrant and alive you can use two shades of the same color and i don't know why this works but it works for me and I think that my picture looks a little bit more appealing if I use 
some different shades and layer them. So I'm not only gonna layer them, but when I put the color on, I'm not gonna press down very hard. I'm just gonna very lightly make the kimonos fabric in little lines to kind of indicate that it's cloth. So if you look very closely at cloth, this could be part of when you're doing your drawing and let's say your character has is wearing some clothes. You could look at the cloth and say, hey, it's really like, if you look very closely, it's um, the threads go in uh, two different ways. And I think I'll do that when I put the color on and then it, maybe it'll look more cloth-like. So those are the kinds of things that are going through my mind when I'm drawing. And so probably my best helpful hint is if you're ever doing a drawing and it doesn't look quite right to you, it looks a little bit weird, you can say, hmm, I'll take that drawing and put it in a mirror. And it's like looking at it for the first time. Because as we draw, our eye kind of gets used to the way it looks. And sometimes you need that jolt of seeing it for the first time. And then you say, oh, one eye is higher than the other. Or maybe my whole character is leaning to one side and I didn't realize it because I've been looking at it for, you know, a couple of hours. And so those are ways that you can improve your drawing. Because don't get discouraged if you make a mistake. That's why pencils have erasers on them. Mm -hmm. And artists are always trying to improve their artwork and they might make a mistake and then fix it, make a mistake and then fix it. And so you always don't listen to that voice that says it's not any good because all artists have that voice and we have to try to ignore it mm -hmm. and keep on working and improving your picture. So I've gone a little bit harder on the edges so that he'll look like he curves around on the sides. And oh, I really want to tell you about going to the New England Aquarium. I went backstage, they had a, um, a large giant Pacific octopus there. Her name is Sai, and she's still there. And she, I got to go, the tank that everybody sees, she's floating around in, and it's really fun to watch her. Watched her for about an hour, and then she kind of went in the corner and Bailey, the aquarist, the man who takes care of her, feeds her, um, cleans her tank, and also measures the different hormones in the water to make sure she's not stressed. They want to take good care of their creatures. And he took me backstage, and they opened the top of this giant tank because octopuses are big escape artists. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times aquariums have found that when they, um, that some of their fish will go missing. <laughs> Sometimes they're very valuable fish and nobody knows why. And it turns out that the octopus will get in the middle of the night, get through their tank, through a little crack, walk <coughs> on the floor, get into another tank, eat the fish, and then get back into their tank. <laughs> they're so smart, they're as smart as a dog. And they, well, Sai is a little bit particular. Every octopus that they have, has a little bit of a different personality, and Sai sometimes likes people and sometimes she doesn't. So the two weeks before I went to meet her, I just ate fish because they can taste with their suckers. Oh, I have to do their, her suckers, his suckers. And um, so I didn't put any like cis skin cream with perfume on it, and I was so relieved when she liked me. She came <laughs> roaring over. First, <laughs> Bailey took a little sh uh, fish and dangled it near her so she knew that she was gonna get a treat. And then she came roaring over and gave me a giant octopus hug. Mm -hmm. She put her, her arms around my arms and then she her suckers started being very strong and then she started to pull me into the tank. <laughs> and that's when Bailey would take her big arms off my arms and they would make a noise like the Velcro. <laughs> and then on my skin I would have little marks from the suckers. So she uh, was very mischievous. Now I've known about horses. I've had horses, uh, dogs, cats, guinea pigs, chickens. Um, but the only animal that I've found that is similar to an octopus would be an elephant. Because they're very highly intelligent, and but they're a little bit mischievous. And the ele African elephants that I've known have had those same traits. So I'm gonna show her suckers now. They, she was really strong. I was amazed. They told me she was going to be strong, and I didn't, I believed them, and I didn't think it would be to the extent that how strong she was. She could have easily pulled me into the tank 
if Bailey had not been pulling her arms off. And you're not used to having a creature with eight different appendages. And as she was pulling us, me into the tank, and Bailey was taking the arms off, she had two other arms going in back of Bailey and finding a little pail of fish treats <laughs> and putting those in the tank for a snack for later. She was really something else. And sometimes she sulks and does not want to go visit people. And so that her suck, the suckers of the octopus are usually this really beautiful pinky purple color. And then when they get more agitated, interested, or excited, they, their coloring will often turn darker and darker red. So instead of making the different colors of the octopus camouflaging itself against the background, I just made the octopuses in my books get darker and darker red. So by the end when they find the Little Mermaid, they're pretty dark red. So that was the way I um, tried to understand their coloration. It's so complex. Scientists are still studying octopus and trying to figure them out. They're so unusual. So now the suckers are done and I brought some white out so I can make the pattern on his kimono-like garb. It's not a true kimono, but similar. And so I'm making the pattern of the suckers, which I thought was kind of a little joke because in Japan, they have many printings of this indigo cloth. Maybe in spring, it would be a branch with buds on it. In the summer, it might be lily pads with a frog. In fall, it might be fall leaves falling. So I thought, well, this will be funny to put the sucker pattern, pattern of the octopus on as kimono. So I might do this with a white watercolor that's called gouache on my book. That's what I might use. So I use a little bit of mixed media and it's not really the classic way of using watercolors. And by the way, when I was little, I used mostly pencil. And I always drew horses because ever since I was in kindergarten, I wanted to be a children's book illustrator. But at that time, I just wanted to draw horses. And then as I got older, then I expanded my horizons a little bit. So here I'm gonna put my name and put the date because 2017, because an artist always tries to get a little bit better every time they draw. And even though I've been illustrating or drawing for 62 years, every time in my heart of hearts, I hope that my drawing's gonna be a little bit better this time. And I, that's the wonderful thing about being an artist. You don't really have to have a teacher or read a book about it. You can just practice and you will get better and better. And all your imagination that everyone has inside will direct them and help you decide what your character is going to look like. And maybe even a story will, uh, you will imagine alongside of it. So thank you very much for being such a good audience, and I'm looking forward to meeting you all and hearing about your artwork. Thank you. There's a train, guys. All right, guys, so here is more. the new book by Jan Brett. It's called The Mermaid. We, after two hours of standing in that line, we met her and got her to sign this book. It was a great morning, a great surprise. We had no idea that she was going to be there this morning. So that was awesome. If you like this video, please give it a big thumbs up. Please hit that big red button and subscribe. And let us know in the comments what you think about G and Brett. All right. See you next time. Bye.